Hello, everyone. Welcome to Business School 101. The United States is one of the wealthiest nations in the world, yet we continue to trade with other countries. Have you ever considered why this is the case? If the U.S. is so powerful, then how does it benefit from international trade? To answer this question, we need to understand two important terms in the international business field, the absolute advantage and the comparative advantage. By definition, a country has an absolute advantage in manufacturing a product over another country if it uses fewer resources to manufacture that product. In other words, a country has an absolute advantage when it manufactures a product more efficiently than any other country. For example, extracting oil in Saudi Arabia is basically just a matter of drilling a hole. In contrast, literally striking oil in other countries could involve considerable exploration and costly technologies for drilling and extraction. Therefore, Saudi Arabia requires less resources than other countries to produce the same amount of oil. As a result, we can say that Saudi Arabia maintains the absolute advantage in oil production. Economists suggest that two countries can benefit from engaging in trade by specializing in the production of goods in which each country has an absolute advantage. To better understand this logic, let's use a simplified example and assume that there are only two countries, the United States and China. They are engaging in trade that both countries can only produce two types of goods, planes and trucks. Before we go any further, please keep in mind that international trade doesn't actually look like this in real life. There are obviously more than two countries in the world, and they produce much more than just two types of goods. However, for the sake of learning, we are going to simplify the underlying logic of international trade, which can be extended to the real business world. Okay, let's say that the United States can produce either 100 planes or 2,500 trucks, and China can produce either 20 planes or 8,000 trucks. In this imaginary international market, one plane can be traded for 200 trucks. For the United States, the production of one plane will cost 1% of its total resources, while the production of one truck will cost 0.04% of its total resources. Similarly, for China, the production of one plane will cost 5% of its total resources, and the production of one truck will cost 0.0125% of its total resources. Since the U.S. uses less of its resources in China to produce planes, we can say that the U.S. holds the absolute advantage in plane production. Similarly, because China uses less of its resources than the U.S. to produce trucks, China holds the absolute advantage in truck production. Therefore, if the U.S. wants to have 1,000 trucks, then it has two options. Option 1. The U.S. chooses to produce trucks itself. This way, the U.S. would need to spend 40% of its total resources. Option 2. The U.S. chooses to spend 5% of its total resources to produce 5 planes and then trades those planes with China for 1,000 trucks. When we compare these two options, it is not difficult to conclude that option 2 is better for the U.S. because it can save a lot of the country's resources while still obtaining the same number of trucks. Therefore, the U.S. benefits from trading with China. Now, how can China also benefit from this trade? If China wants to have five planes, then it also has two options. Option one, China decides to produce the planes itself, which will cost 25% of its total resources. Option two, China spends 12.5% of its total resources to produce 1,000 trucks and then trades those trucks with the U.S. for five planes. So, China also benefits from the trade by saving half of its resources. By studying these examples, we now can understand that both countries can benefit from trading by specializing in the production of goods in which each country has an absolute advantage. However, this is not always the case in the real world. What if one country holds the absolute advantage in both products? Will that country still be able to benefit from trading with other countries? To answer these questions, we need to understand another important term, the comparative advantage. By definition, if a country can manufacture a product at a lower opportunity cost than another country, then it has a comparative advantage for manufacturing that product. Opportunity cost refers to the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. I know this sounds a little confusing, so let's use an example to explain. This time let's assume that there are only two countries, 
the United States and China, engaging in trade and that both countries only produce two goods, planes and trucks. China can still produce either 20 planes or 8,000 trucks. However, this time, the United States can either produce 100 planes or 10,000 trucks. In this imaginary international market, one plane can still be traded for 200 trucks. For the United States, the production of one plane will cost 1% of its total resources, while the production of one truck will cost 0.01% of its total resources. Similarly for China, the production of one plane will cost 5% of its total resources, and the production of one truck will cost 0.0125% of its total resources. In this scenario, the U.S. spends less resources on both plane and truck production than China. In other words, the U.S. holds the absolute advantage on the productions of both planes and trucks. So how can the U.S. still benefit from trading with China? To answer this question, we need to calculate the opportunity cost for each country. As I mentioned earlier, the opportunity cost refers to the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. Because the U.S. can spend its resources to produce either 100 planes or 10,000 trucks in this example, the opportunity cost for the U.S. to produce one plane is 100 trucks, and the opportunity cost for the U.S. to produce one truck is 0.01 planes. Similarly, because China can produce either 20 planes or 8,000 trucks, the opportunity cost for China to produce one plane is 400 trucks, and the opportunity cost for China to produce one truck is 0.0025 planes. Compared with the U.S., China has less opportunity cost to produce one truck, so we can say that China holds that comparative advantage for truck production. In contrast, the U.S. has less opportunity cost to produce one plane, so we can say that the U.S. holds the comparative advantage for plane production. Now, let's still assume that the U.S. needs 1,000 trucks and that it still has two options. Option 1. The U.S. spends 10% of its total resources to produce those trucks itself. Option 2. The U.S. spends 5% of its total resources to produce 5 planes and then trades those planes with China for 1,000 trucks. As you can see, option 2 is still better for the U.S. because it can save half of the country's resources while still obtaining the same number of trucks. We can conclude from this example that even though one country holds the absolute advantage for both products, it can still benefit from trading by specializing in the production of goods in which it has a comparative advantage. In general, the absolute and comparative advantage theories help us immensely in understanding why countries should get involved in global trade. However, these theories also suffer many limitations. First, we have not taken the product feature and quality as well as the cost of resources into consideration. For example, 1% of American resources might cost a different amount than 1% of China's resources. Also, trucks made in the U.S. might have different product features and quality than trucks made in China. Second, we have assumed that resources can move freely from the manufacturing of one product to another within a country. In reality, this is not always the case, especially during an unusual period such as a trade war or a global pandemic. Third, we have failed to acknowledge transportation costs between countries. Although the absolute advantage and comparative advantage theories may have drawbacks, they are still valuable because they illustrate the fundamental logic of global trade. So, what do you think about the absolute and comparative advantage? Do they make sense to you? Please leave your thoughts in a comment below. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.